tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. July 4th, probably. Somewhere likely in America. The moon glared down at me with carefully manicured disinterest which bordered on disrespectful. So casually callous, I half expected a slow blink or slight rolling of the cratered orb. It did not. That time, I tapped out a cigarette and lit it while the too loud ambient noise of the forest behind me screamed out a cacophonous hell of cottonous limbs and insect desires warbled over the quiet outskirts of some small town in the middle of what I reasonably ascertained was somewhere in America. Red, white, and blue plastic decorations hung limply over the empty main street. The silence of the town ahead of me was in direct opposition to the wall of sound behind me. The two crashed around me as I monkey-fucked a cigarette off the soon-to-be smashed butt of its brother and wondered what type of storm had begun to whip itself into a frenzy before I had even arrived. Or hadn't. I don't really fucking know. I just knew at that exact moment that I didn't like the vibes much, or the way the sunset over the town seemed to set buildings on fire in the distance as everything wavered insubstantially in front of me. Was that even a word? Felt too long in my brain, but I'll be goddamned if it didn't fit. A slow croak snapped me from the Merriam-Webster section of my brain, and I looked down to see a toad staring up at me with an impatient glare. Uh, you'll have to pardon me. It's been a while since I've spoken to anyone. This all feels a touch surreal. I apologize to the toad watching me from the sidewalk. Things have been weird, you know. The toad croaked lethargically. There was a hint of warning to the croak, one I didn't have the sense to heed. I don't rightly know what you're saying, but I will most likely ignore good sense and continue into town. I need smokes, and I was hoping to try to score some nose candy, I replied. You know where a stranger could find, either? The toad blinked up at me. Two sets of lids closed, then slid back open. Okay, I don't rightly know what that means. You want to try it again in English, compadre? The toad stared at me silently. Its stroke flared, and I saw only confusion in the black eyes. I nodded. It flared its stroke once more before it hopped off into the grass toward town. Nice enough guy, I reckon, but a shit conversationalist. The best of them were, or so I found, in the last however many years. How many years was that now? Shit's been a tad bit fuckered up, and time felt more like a loose definition than an actual construct. Or I've been more than a bit fuckered. I don't rightly know any longer, and the thought of deciphering the seamless endless ocean of madness and raw enjoyment which has been the full focus of my literal existence leaves me feeling slightly apprehensive at facing the things I've been party to. I got a pretty big dick out of it, though, so perspective tends to be a fluid event horizon on which I find myself dangerously oscillating. I am little more than a splintered piece of flotsam floating in the eternity of sinuous darkness. Probably. I mean, honestly, who in the fuck am I, anyway? No, seriously. Who am I? I don't care for the desperation in the question. Fortunately for my delicate and wholly flooded with illicit drugs brain, fireworks exploded above me. At least I think they were fireworks. I truly cannot stress the dangerously high level of hallucinogens which deeply saturated my gray matter. All I knew for sure was that goddamn panther's eye in the sky was getting a grand view of blue night flowers as they bloomed and spread, most likely. I quickly utilized my keen intellect and with the light show above and patriotic vestments that bedazzled the town, eventually deduced that it must be the 4th of July. It was a 4th of July show in New York City where that Jezebel Cherry spiked my drink with LSD at a talking head show. I feel like I've mentioned this before, though. 
I managed to pull my gaze off the ever-brightening sky of rockets' red glare and bombs bursting in air, or whatever the fuck was, or was not happening above me, and began walking toward where I was reasonably sure the fireworks were being launched, which turned out to be a quaint yet empty park. That was a mite peculiar. I stood and watched the balls of flame and something or other launched into the air for a moment before an epiphany dawned on me. If I could see blankets, then likely there must be coolers as well, and coolers meant beer. I may have understated the condition of the park in my initial assessment, I decided, as I ventured into what looked less like a park and more like a war zone. The blankets were flung everywhere upon closer inspection, poorly manicured little park. The more I looked around for an intact cooler, the more damage came into view. The brightly colored fabric hung from tree branches or were punched into the ground in deep six or eight inch indentations. There were shoes all over the place, along with scraps of fabric that could have been clothing. I found it all to be more than a little unsettling. That is, until I spotted a nice cooler sitting unscathed in the chaos. I made a beeline toward it as the sky blossomed with orange and green explosions. The cooler proved to be not only intact, but packed with bottles of what I assumed was beer. I raised one up and tried to figure out if it was real beer or something made for children. Hints of cranberry and citrus, I read out loud in bewilderment. I twisted off the cap and flipped it behind my shoulder as I took a long, thirsty chug from the cold bottle. I didn't quite detect notes of cranberry or citrus. I did, unfortunately, taste notes of what I assumed to be rat's piss and syphilitic discharge. God damn, everything reminds me of cherry. And what in the fuck is an IPA? I dug through the cooler and began to pray it was the window pane rather than reality having spun into one where beer went from a golden lager of the gods to whatever in the fuck the abomination which coated my tongue like a truck stop whore who ignored the no kissing part of the transaction was. I tossed the bottles onto the ground as I searched for one bottle of that sweet mass-produced ambrosia brewed in the Rockies. All I found besides the cranberry was blood orange and, judging by both the logo on the label and the taste, I could only assume blood orange was a euphemism for anal bleeding. Then I saw what usurped the ravished part for the most peculiar side of the evening. On the other side of the meteor launchers appeared to be a ten-foot-long ant. I took another drink of the rectal leakage-flavored beer and watched in fascination as its mandible snapped at the warm air and its antennae twitched spasmatically. If it were real, which I could only stress is roughly 98% of approximately 32% of the time, the six legs supporting the three neon green swollen segments of the creature seemed to line up well with the divots in the grass. If any of that were real, I found myself able to accept a gigantic green ant with a large black eye that felt a little too trained on my exact location over this absolute fucking clown shoes of an excuse for a beer. And then it hit me. The faintest hint of blood orange seemed to peek up in the turgid swill of what could be best described as coagulated feral ant glands and rainwater collected in the half-desiccated wound of Nathaniel Budweiser's beloved grandmother. It was almost pleasant. Huh, I'll be good and goddamn that this isn't growing on me a little, I said out loud. Too loudly, I discovered, as the ant jerked and was fully focused on me. I took another drink as it cocked its head. Both of those black eyes were unquestionably locked on me. It seemed cautious, for good reason, as the incendiaries continued to fly into the sky from the tubes planted in a line between the two of us. I didn't quite fathom why the damn things kept shooting off, but I saw wires and some fancy doodad I assumed was a timer of some sort. Hell, I should have been at least mildly terrified, and was, but not at the cotton-covered toxic green abomination. I found myself pondering if I had misjudged the cranberry and citrus as well. It wasn't as if I was opposed to fruity flavors. I'd been known to get stoned and eat an entire box of fruity pebbles from one huge bowl using a ladle as a spoon. 
But there is an expectation when you crack open a beer, hops, water, a frog pissing in a barrel on the side of the can. I needed a joint, maybe an eight ball. Definitely an eight ball, just to take off one edge and replace it with a new one. The ain't, because it sure as fuck wasn't an ant, did not seem to know what to do about what was assuredly prey, but prey which was refusing to act at all prey-like, which was all right with me because I didn't feel much like prey anyhow. I finished the beer, not quite entirely happy about it, but also willing to ignore that momentarily. It was fine, I reckon. What wasn't fine was the loud belch I let out as I tossed the empty over my shoulder. That was a mistake. The ain't decided the belch must have been some sort of battle cry. And while it was a pretty good burp, a cry for battle it was not. After the next volley erupted and the sky was lit up by what was either an ethereal jellyfish swimming lazily around the sky panther's eye, or possibly green explosions, the ain't quickly clambered toward me and one of its powerful limbs smacked into one of the canisters. My fight-or-flight receptors had long since given up at that point, so I simply grabbed another beer and opened it as the glowing green death tumbled toward me. Despite all the evidence, though, if there was a hint of cranberry anywhere in that rat's diet, it had certainly been accidental. As the ain't reared back before what I guessed would be his mandible snapping me in half, I stood draining the beer and holding a finger up at it. I didn't feel as if my impending doom was about to crash down on me, though I did belch once more with an equal intensity to the previous one, which froze the ain't in place just long enough for the fireworks to go through another quick cycle. From the cadence of the blast, it must have been the beginning of the grand finale. As the pulsating green, the shade of glow-in-the-dark paint monstrosity was about to drop down onto its front legs, the first fireworks smashed into its back from the tipped-over tube. The creature was rocked from the impact and a shower of burning cinders sprayed around the two of us. Then a second hit it and punched through the exoskeleton of the middle segment. My basic understanding of basic ant physiology being shaky at best, I'd say the thorax, because I am relatively certain it's a word. The speed of the blast grew into a crescendo that I found myself being showered by whatever the goop that fills an ain't was made of. There were no hints of citrus nor cranberries to be found there either, just shrapnel from the chunks of armored slop underneath a sky full of misplaced patriotism. I saluted the fading ember sloppily and watched as the green faded slowly. I stepped forward and tentatively poked at the shuddering, smoking corpse of the ain't. It felt real, or real enough to make me briefly consider it was actually there. Didn't matter. Nothing did. Far as I knew, there was still a reasonable chance I was lying in my bed in the trailer, sweating my way through a fever dream of a trip filled with cerulean space spunk and lavender lights. Any minute it could let go and I'd wake up with that dumb bastard Pat shaking me. I'm pretty sure he got absorbed, though. I tapped out a cigarette, the last one, and debated one more bottle of faintly orange rectal fissure when I saw a toad, possibly the one from earlier, staring at me once more. I nodded my head at him. I should have listened to you earlier, friend. You tried to warn me. Sort of. The toad flared out its throat at me and let out a warbled croak. I ain't gonna try and repeat that. My name's Ursa. I think I'll call you Elmer. The toad sat with a pensive look, then croaked once, which I took to be agreement. Well then, Elmer, it's a pleasure to meet you, I replied. In the distance, I heard what could have been screams, though they were muffled by explosions. Elmer cocked his head at me and croaked, long and plaintive. I shook my head. I just need to know which way the nearest gas station is. The giant fucking ants are none of my concern, whether they're real or not. I felt shame at the look the toad gave me, but it turned and began hopping toward the far end of the park. I lit the last smoke and tossed the pack into the open cooler before following. 
I didn't know what the toad expected me to do about a dead town filled with monster green ants, but whatever it was, I most certainly was not the man for the job. I wasn't a hero. Shit, I was just trying to exist. Then that goddamn storm came over to trailer park and sent my chemically altered consciousness into the most perverse slip and slide imaginable. My rudimentary understanding of the human psyche, which was more a series of well-defined legs peeking out from short skirts as Freud configured it all into a haze of cocaine and mommy issues. Or something. I was only there to get laid. Didn't I already tell that story? It all had blurred into a technicolor slush filled with melting people and empty towns, punctuated by confused moments in which everything is spectacularly suspect, such as following a toad through a park while looking for a gas station to get some smokes. Mr. Elmer D. Toad wasn't even the first toad I chose to follow. The first was bright red with a yellow streak I swear was a mohawk. That son of a bitch had a propensity for smoking the last joint and leaving without a croak. He always seemed to show up whenever I scored a fresh bag, but he had an unerring sense of direction and I just sort of assumed Elmer did as well. Did I stereotype all toads? Likely. My dad said all sparrows were assassins for the Vatican, used to kill demons, so maybe systemic stereotyping is a learned behavior. Fuck if I knew. All I wanted was an eight ball and some smokes, so I was following my best chance despite the teeming intolerance I was showing toward amphibians. Again. I took psychology in hopes of studying anatomy, which is the most accurate summation of my entire existence so far. Sue me. As I stepped out of the park, a tattered banner caught my eye as it flapped flaccidly against the street. Happy Fourth of July, Xenia. Hi. Well, hello yourself, Xenia, I said, mostly to myself. Fires raged ahead, along with the crackle of electrical wires and an almost rhythmic popping sound I figured was either fireworks or heavy machine gun fire. I didn't rightly know why I seemed to recognize heavy machine gun fire. Flashes of a giant armadillo with guns flashed through my head, but that made about as much sense as ain'ts in Xenia. Ain'ts and Xenia. Those doesn't even feel like real words, just noises. I reckon all words are just noises, though. No. For fuck's sake, I am not following that train of thought. I recognize Xenia meant hospitality in Greek, but that's only because my mother had an unhealthy fascination with mythology. So much so, she named me her little bear, just in different noises that mean the same thing. God damn it all. I needed to find smokes. And then I had a transcendent experience on par with being born again into the bosom of God herself. Senia Dispensary was written in bright block letters, and next to them was a pot leaf. If that was the window pane, I could forgive the sewage that passed for beer in this timeline if it meant weed was legal. I pushed the door open and found the store empty of people, but that didn't matter in the slightest as I felt tears streaming down my cheeks at the plethora of earthly delights laid out in front of me. Giant glass jars filled with what looked like the stickiest of buds and wonderful names like Girl Scout Cookies and OG Kush. I assumed it was Turkish. My stomach rumbled as I grabbed a cookie and shoved it into my mouth. I couldn't remember the last time I had a cookie. So I ate three more to satisfy the craving I hadn't realized I had. Then I realized something even more amazing. Each of the treats was loaded up with weed. On the off chance it was all real, I began stuffing my pockets with candies, and I dumped the entire jar labeled Cheetah Cock into a convenient gallon-sized baggie. The ain'ts were a small price to pay for a slice of nirvana like this, Excuse me, mister. Look, on account of Armageddon going on in the streets and all, I don't mind so much the looting. No, I do mind the looting, but I feel the need to warn you. Those three cookies you just smashed into your mouth are gonna kick in soon, and uh, 
I don't know if you're prepared for that on top of everything else that's going on out there. A calm voice said from out of nowhere. I turned my head toward the door and saw Elmer sitting in the doorway. I looked down at the cookies and saw they said something about THC in 75. Again, those were just noises that meant something to someone. If you could talk this entire fucking time, Elmer, then why did you wait until now to do it? A little heads up about the ain'ts and this glorious establishment to lead off with, at the very fucking least. I said sourly to Elmer, who flared his throat out petulantly. Who are you talking to, mister? The voice said again. It didn't match Elmer at all. I turned slowly and saw a barefoot woman with long brown hair and some kind of band shirt and zero pants holding a shotgun and glaring at me. I pointed at Elmer. This rapscallion is Elmer. He's shit as a guide. I thought you were him. She nodded at me and then at Elmer, which I found to be quite polite and spoke well of her character. Fuck, maybe three cookies on a stomach filled with bad beer was a mistake. You okay? She asked me. I smiled at her. You know what? That is a hell of a question. And one I'm wholly incapable of answering presently. She squeezed her lips tight as she stared at me for a moment, and then gave a confident nod and smiled back at me. Name is Chrissy, and I own the shop you just committed a felony robin. I set the bag of weed on the counter with a large amount of sadness. I smiled at her sheepishly. To be honest, I am not 100% sure any of this is happening. Yet that does not rescue me of guilt. I'm Ursa. I just got here, mostly. Picked an absolute shit time to show up in Xenia, Ursa. You may want to pick that bag back up and run whichever way you came from. Chrissy replied. I grabbed the bag once more and slipped it into the backpack I forgot I had been wearing. I rummaged through the backpack and shouted, Hallelujah! fucking Louia! Chrissy gripped the shotgun a little tighter as I pulled out a pack of cigarettes with a happy flourish. I smiled at her as I pulled off the cellophane. You mind? She shook her head and I lit up a smoke and felt the smile stretching even wider as the nicotine hit my bloodstream. You seen the ain'ts? Chrissy leaned the shotgun against the counter and pulled out a cigarette. The giant fucking ants? <laughs> yes, I've seen them. Huh, I wasn't sure, not totally. There's a dead one at the park. The groundskeepers have their work cut out for themselves, I said, noticing my mouth had gotten incredibly dry. Pretty green, though. Chrissy, are you okay? A voice called from upstairs. Nothing to worry about, just caught a looter. We're having a cigarette. Chrissy called back. Is he one of the giant fucking ants? Uh, no, ma'am. Just your run-of-the-mill accidental looter. I answered, feeling strange at being talked about as if I wasn't there. Uh, and my friend Elmer is here. Elmer croaked loudly. Wait, was that a fucking frog? Are the fucking frogs giant now? Elmer is normal-sized and a toad. I answered before Chrissy could open her mouth. I turned to Elmer. Don't get all judgmental. She's upstairs after all. Is he talking to the fucking toad? Danny, why don't you just come down here and meet Ursa? Chrissy said. Elmer let out a low, warbling croak. And Elmer? She quickly amended. Danny, I knew through deduction, came down the stairs, equally barefoot and pantless, and glared at me from the doorway. You're a real piece of shit breaking into a business in a crisis. My jaw dropped. I didn't break into anything. Danny looked at Chrissy. You didn't lock the fucking door? Chrissy took a drag off her cigarette and rolled her eyes. Because a gigantic fucking ant can't open the door? What is a deadbolt going to do to stop one from coming in? Danny wanted to argue. I could see it crackle in front of her eyes. A storm that couldn't quite find the muster. She grabbed a cigarette from Chrissy's hand and took a drag before turning the glare back at me. You still decided to help yourself, Mr. Fucking Scumbag. I shrugged. That is fair enough, I reckon. It's been a while since I've socialized, and while that doesn't excuse my pillage in your establishment, the ain't sort of have me off kilter. Chrissy frowned. 
How long has it been? My jaw worked up and down a couple times, and then I shrugged. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Hell, I don't know how much of it I believe. Ursa, three hours ago we were getting baked and about to go to the park to watch the fireworks. Chrissy began. They were lovely. I might dangerous, I interjected. She frowned, but continued. The gigantic ants. Ants, I corrected. For fuck's sake, it's been a long time since you had a conversation with anything but a fucking toad. Danny yelled. Elmer croaked and I glared at him. You're not exactly a world-class conversationalist yourself, Elmer. If you don't have anything of value to add, kindly let the ladies talk. Chrissy giggled and Danny just stared at me in disbelief. I gestured for Chrissy to continue. She shrugged and stubbed out the smoke. The ants came crawling over the buildings. We heard the screams and ran back here. Phones are out and we didn't want to risk driving at night. We were just about to try and sleep. Danny pointed at me. What year is it? No idea. I answered as I lit another cigarette. The words floated in the air in front of me and I waved my hand to dissipate them. Okay, what year do you think it might be? She pressed. I shut my eyes and tried to do the math. It was 83 when the spunk fell. Uh, things get blurry from there. Something about Belize, hippos in Colombia, maybe? There was that fucking dragon, but I'm not 100% convinced that happened. I opened my eyes and felt the three stares. I imagine it's around 87. Chrissy grabbed the cookie and shoved it into her mouth and chewed very slowly before she asked. 1987? What sort of asinine question is that? Of course I mean 1987. It's 2023. Danny said softly. <laughs> I laughed until I realized they weren't smiling. <laughs> huh? I tried to think. There was no way it had been 40 years. I would be old as fuck, and I was exactly as I had always been. I reached down and double-checked. Well, maybe not exactly as I had always been. Was it all real? I asked them. The words fell numbly from my mouth. I needed a drink. Chrissy saw my distress and grabbed a plastic bottle and handed it to me. I stared at it. Is this just water, or is this like the beer? Why is it in the bottle? I asked. I began to look around the store, and things seemed out of place. I felt the edge of panic rising. I twisted the cap off, but I was squeezing the bottle so hard the water came spraying into the air as I crushed it. I just stared at them and felt the frantic energy as it seized my heart. Danny was there immediately and put one hand on my shoulder and gently pried the bottle from my hand. Chrissy came over with a second bottle and took the cap off for me. I held it gingerly and took a sip. It tasted like cold nothing. I am suspended in translucent blue, lavender light spark all around me. Danny squeezed my shoulder. Why don't you start from the beginning? It all started with me finding a piece of foil under an errant Brussels sprout. And David Bowie. He wasn't there. I'm not crazy. It, it did begin raining balls of gelatin and what could be best described as splooge. It all started so pleasantly, really. Uh, sure, a few raccoons and cats and a dumb fuck named Pat. A noted woman beater with a big cock, and I think maybe the entire trailer park I lived in got sort of eaten, I began. Except for the dogs and children, same thing happened to the neighboring town. Danny said, her grip on my shoulder tightened. I looked at her and blinked a couple times. It is against the rules to kill dogs and kids. Who made that rule? Chrissy asked. I gestured vaguely and shrugged. No fucking way. You're the Ursa? Where's the blob? Danny asked excitedly. She looked at Chrissy. Hey, we might not be fucked. I, I remember uh, Art Bell did a story on our esteemed looter friend. There were stories of sightings over the years, but never any proof. This was all a bit much for me. Had I spent 40 years wreaking havoc across the globe, blissfully unaware? Where's the blob? 
Danny asked again. I have no idea what you're talking about. None of that is real. Ask Elmer. I came to town alone just before the fireworks, I said defensively. Elmer didn't say a word. Goddamn traitor. Yeah, all the stories said the same thing. A strange man and a huge blue blob that seemed to listen to what he said. They even have your name right, Ursa. Danny insisted. I walked to the door and gestured broadly behind me toward the street. Do you see any goddamn blue blob out here? They didn't answer, but both grew pale. I turned around slowly and saw another ain't across the street on the side of the building with its head craned to stare directly at me. If ever there was a time for a giant blue blob, that was it. The ain't did something peculiar then. The center segment, I will still insist on calling it the thorax, began to swell and undulate slightly. I stared with a mixture of curiosity and stark terror. The mass began to work its way from the thorax to the head, and I had a bad feeling as I turned and ran as fast as my somewhat responsive legs would carry me. I managed to snag Danny and Chrissy by the sleeves and ushered them to the stairs. They needed no more encouragement and began to scramble up the stairs with me right behind. A lesser man would remark upon the derrieres on display in front of him. I, however, was a gentleman. One with a new penis I was reasonably sure had not been used in forty years. All thoughts were erased as whatever had been building up in the ink came crashing through the bottom floor. I saw a wave of viscous liquid, the same toxic green as the ain't, splash against the stairs and a sizzling sound like a million stinging bees assaulted my ears. And then my heart shattered as I fell to my knees. I let out a hoarse scream of anguish. Elmer! The fucking frog? Danny shouted. I turned to her and pointed a shaking finger. He was a toad, and he was my friend! I grabbed my cigarettes and fumbled out one. The loss of Elmer hit me harder than I expected. We'd only known one another a short period of time, but he had an old soul. If he had been there at all, I dropped my lighter and stared in horror as it bounced down the stairs. If it hit the pool of bubbling green ooze, I'd have to find another fucking lighter, and I had already made a fucking mess of finding the smokes I procured. I chased after the bouncing hunk of plastic as the entire universe wobbled around me. I nearly lost my balance, but Chrissy appeared behind me and steadied me. I nodded at her gratefully and saw Danny staring at something. Her mouth dropped open and her face was suddenly flushed with that eerie emerald glow. It seemed to grow brighter as I watched. She looked down at me with an awful acceptance. Or maybe that acceptance was my own. Fuck, I was sobbing because of a goddamn toad. To say my grasp on the situation was tenuous would have been the understatement of the century. I didn't even want to entertain thoughts of it being a different fucking millennium than I had blissfully not given two fucks about hours prior. Instead, I wrapped my arms around Chrissy to stop her from charging back into a certain death as the upstairs wall was blown inward by a second radioactive loogie. I saw the brick and glass batter Danny before the spray caught her, and she was just erased. I expected the runoff to flood down the stairs and melt Chrissy and I the same way it had Danny and Elmer. That was wishful thinking. Rather than a quick death, the remaining structure decided it probably had enough of this bullshit and began to crumble. And we fell for what felt like forever. But in actuality, it was only a bone jarring 15 feet as brick and lumber rained down on top of us. We both laid there and moaned for a couple of seconds. I moved my limbs and was happy to only feel as if every bone had been broken. I felt something beneath my fingers and grasped my lighter tight. Near as I could tell, the fucking thing had saved not only mine, but Chrissy's life as well. Chrissy squirmed next to me and I squeezed her. Well, something. It was soft and probably shouldn't have been in my hand, but it was meant to be comforting. 
The last thing either of us needed to do was to alert the ain't we weren't deceased. I don't know that I ever contemplated what noises an ant made before that moment. They were so small and with my rudimentary understanding, I seem to recall they communicated through pheromones. Previous to that exact moment, I had never had most of a stairwell on top of me as I gripped the strange woman by what I was certain had to be a breast. While listening for the silent sounds of a goddamned ain't that may or may not use any type of vocalization whatsoever. I guess all words are just noises, or possibly fucking scents as well. The world was far more complicated than I really felt like pondering at that exact moment. The rubble on top of us began to bounce, making sure to bruise every inch of our already battered bodies. I closed my eyes and prepared myself for whatever fresh hell awaited me. Everything went silent for an eternity crushed into a matter of seconds. A large explosion shook the top layer of sediment from Chrissy and I and we both turned our heads to see what appeared to be a fucking tank idling on the street. As we stared in bewildered amazement, the hatch on top of the tank flipped open with a rusty squeal, and I swear to Christ a garden gnome popped his head out with an excited holler. Chrissy removed my hand from her breast and pushed herself to a sitting position and surveyed the wreckage that had been her home and business. I pulled out my badly crumpled smokes and placed one in my mouth as I tried to figure out exactly how much of this absolute fucking insanity was really real. Turned out, all of it, probably. Fucked if I could really tell. Right when I thought I had a grasp on what was happening, the garden gnome with his long beard scampered out of the tank. That was sort of surreal. When a second head poked out, I am pretty sure a bit of my brain oozed out of my ear. A giant with long black hair and an equally long, unkempt beard wearing a pink bunny costume came out. Chrissy! The pink bunny giant bellowed. Brad? Holy fuck! And Jason? Chrissy said, sounded nearly as confused as I felt. Where's Danny? The gnome asked as he came over and helped Chrissy up. I just laid there smoking and waiting for it all to shift. A beach would be nice. I could bury my toes in the sand and drink rum as the sun burnt me to a crisp. When it got to be too much, I could dive into the crystal clear blue of the ocean. I was suspended in raspberry jello. Blueberries swam around me, flashing little bursts of antioxidants. I was safe. I felt stationary as the world moved around me. Hills and forests passed through me. There was a series of cabins. Armed rednecks guarded steels and bathtubs filled with chemicals, meth and moonshine. You okay, mister? The gnome asked, and I gathered from his expression not for the first time. I sat up with a groan and shrugged. <clears throat> if I'm being honest with you, Mr. Garden Gnome... I wish I had listened to Elmer and skipped visiting Xenia altogether. Who in the hell is Elmer? The pink bunny asked. Elmer was a toad. This guy's Ursa. Chrissy said numbly. Danny was in there, but then she wasn't. The gnome wrapped Chrissy in a hug, and there were tears in the bunny's eyes. We all gathered up at the National Guard shelter when the ants came swarming into town. The bunny said. I didn't see you or Danny at the park, or in the bunker. So you took a tank? That's pretty fucking cool, I said as I stared at the tank. I swore this wasn't the first time I had seen one of these beauties in action, but I couldn't quite figure out when. Brad was as concerned with checking on the girls as he was on restocking. The gnome, who I was nearly sure was Jason, started before he froze. I didn't want to look. The sickly green color which flooded the mouth of what I guessed was an alleyway made lifting my head little more than self-inflicted torture. The smoking crater across the street where the single ain't had been was filled with around a dozen of the bastards. The glow began to shine on top of the building still standing across the street as well. How many shells you bring? I asked quietly. The bunny Brad looked at me sheepishly. It's fucking Xenia. 
We didn't even know if the one shell we had was going to work. Despite the predicament I found myself in, I couldn't help but like these misfits I found myself surrounded by. None held a candle to Elmer, but that just stood to reason. He truly was the best of us. I felt something missing inside of me, a loss I couldn't quite understand. It wasn't Elmer. Look, Ursa, if you do have some kind of blob friend you can call to save us, now might be the best time. Chrissy said. A blob? Brad asked. Like a pet? I felt a stab and pain flash in my skull. Hillbilly meth in moonshine. Too much attention. Helicopter circling above. A cave. A place to hide. A lake of green, rusted barrels. Strange mushrooms on the walls. A tentative tentacle of cerulean space spunk touches the viridescent fungi. A thread of emerald snakes into the mass. Pain. The green spreads. Lavender lights turn to ash as the poison spreads. I let out a roar of pain that made everything, human and ain't, cower back for a moment. I gritted my teeth yet managed to mutter words that held little meaning at the moment. He isn't a pet. Brad tried to smile. Some of the hill people made it to the shelter. They said there was a blue thing that tore through one of the camps a day ago, right before the ants showed up. Ants, I corrected absently. The pain was a spike and I felt sweat dripping down my back. Brad raised his hands apologetically. The ant swarm forgotten as something about me made him even more nervous. Um, Ursa? Chrissy said. Your eyes are glowing. Pretty purple. Brad said. The ain't sent something as I raised my hands and saw tiny beads of blue cum on my palms. It all came back to me in a nauseating flash. We had been out cruising the hills and stumbled upon a pretty choice cook operation. We'd kept a pretty low profile for a spell after heading back stateside, but we both had a hankering for something a little spicier than the bountiful harvest nature had bestowed. We underestimated the seriousness of the operation and decided discretion was the better part of valor. Plus, we had scored a few barrels of whiskey and a bunch of fucking meth. The goo, likely the same goo that had infected the ants, had done a number on us. He shot me out to save me while he fought to get whatever it was off. But a little bit had tainted the last few moments and knocked me loop-the-loop. A strange noise came tumbling down the street. No, not down the street so much as beneath the street. The sound got louder and the sewer covers rattled in place and lavender lights seemed to flicker momentarily. The ain't scurried back a bit, sensing the looming threat. What the fuck is happening? Jason said. I smiled broadly and pointed out at the street and announced, That Mr. Garden Gnome is my bestest friend in the world. Come say hello, Blobber. Blobbert? The three said it once. One of the sewer covers shot into the air and sliced through an ink perched a little too close to the edge of the two-story building across the street. This was followed by a ropey tendril of what can best be described as intergalactic blue semen filled with lavender fireflies that blasted through the building itself before it skewered another ink that hadn't had the good sense to flee when its compatriot was vivisected by whirling iron. To be fair, without even the most rudimentary understanding of the psychology of ants, much less regarding ants, seeing your friend slice down the center, the realization that inside that exoskeleton is nothing except a rancid goo flushed with meth runoff and toxic spill, it has to really show your place in the universe. Blobbert was smaller than I suddenly remembered once again. Peculiar. Unless... Blobbert, eat that fucking ant and get down here. We have to have words, I yelled. Blobbert enveloped the ant halves, but the lavender lights were all focused on me. Uh, you nice folks best skedaddle. I reckon Blobbert and I can handle this. Well, Blobbert more so than me. Got a big dick out of it, I said to Brad. 
Then I winked at Chrissy. I even used it. Wasn't sure, but I did. Probably a mediocre wiener, and despite the size. A spray of toxic goop splashed down onto the tank and flooded the open cockpit. Brad barely scampered out of the range of the blast, though a drop hit one of his floppy pink ears and I saw a trail of smoke rise into the air. He was not a pink bunny. That felt important. I ushered them toward the wreckage rather than down the alley where mandibles awaited. They clambered across the debris as well as they could. The ants all seemed to be staring at Blobber. That was good. Any time now, asshole, I yelled. Blobbert scooped up the other ants' carcass and slid down to me. One of the ants in the ruins across the street spat a toxic loogie at us, but Blobbert casually swung the wreckage of the tank into the air and deflected the spray and smashed it down into a couple ants. But the lavender was concentrated on me. Did you erase my memories of you in case you died? I asked him, oblivious of the danger around us. In mass, the lavender darted to examine what must have been a truly exemplary piece of fucking debris. Hey! I snapped my fingers at him. What kind of regurgitated hippo shit is that? That isn't what partners do. That isn't what family does. You crossed the fucking line, Blobber. I noticed the three stooges were standing still in front of the former dispensary as ants approached down the street. This isn't over, Blobber. We will have words but I reckon we best save Xenia first. You need to eat. No people. Get! I yelled. The rubble behind the trio shifted strangely, and I yelled, Get back here! Change of plans! Rapido! Chrissy snapped to first, and slapped Jason as she tugged at Brad. They saw the movement all around then, and added a bit of pep to their movements. Did you just yell at Blobber? Brad asked. I'm pretty sure the spunky bastard dosed me double hard when he zapped my brain, I replied a bit angrily. He loves you. He didn't want you to miss him, Chrissy said softly. That is sweet. Terrifying, but sweet. Her statement of Blobbert's affection was underscored by the concussive blasts of toxic ink loogies as they smashed against the remaining building of Main Street. Blobbert had tripled in size. Whatever his body was made of had found a way to neutralize the radiation of the ants. The issue was then one of overwhelming odds as dozens of ants swarmed around Blobbert and took great chunks of him with snaps of their mandibles. All the motherfuckers decided to get in on the all-you-can-eat cum fest and ignored us completely in their avarice. Blobbert put up a hell of a fight, but soon the swarm was bloated and the green glow was replaced by a light blue. We are so fucked, Jason said as the last of the mutated bastards consumed the remaining pools of twitching space cum. I looked at him sadly and squeezed his shoulder. I always expected garden gnomes to be a mite more optimistic. Have faith, my friend. You'll be guarding a flower bed once more soon enough. He scrunched up his face. Why do you keep calling me a garden gnome? Brad, not the bunny, answered quickly. Long beard, round belly, short. The real question should be how we haven't been calling you this the entire time. The bunny gets it, I said as I lit a smoke and watched the ants. Once the last of the alien bukkake spill was slurped up, the ants turned and faced us. I saw three of them tense up, and I just took a long drag off my cigarette with a smile stretching across my face. How had I forgotten my best friend? How had I let him make me forget? The missing part of me was now glowing in the belly of the swarming mass. It had been a real roller coaster of a day, and I was looking forward to smoking about seven joints of the weed in my backpack. The smoke felt good in my lungs, but I felt it burning. Ursa, what do we do? Chrissy asked. I handed her the smoke and she took a drag and then passed it back. We wait for Blobber to stop acting like a fucking drama queen and take care of those motherfucking ants. That's <laughs> simple, huh? She asked back. I shrugged. Likely not. I expect it to be quite horrific. For the ants, at least. Mr. Ursa, I hate to bring this up, but the ants ate your blob friend. Brad said timidly. 
I nodded. Reckon that's accurate. And now the ants are starting to come over here, he added, the timid taking a tinge of panic. They do appear to be getting closer. This is your first time in a gornado. I just got my memories back, and I still always forget what one of these is like for the uninitiated, I said and stubbed out the cigarette. Did you say gornado? Jason asked. I did. Try to keep your eyes and mouth shut, I said as I tucked my smokes into my back pocket and backed up against the wall. The ants were halfway across the street when the first one freaked out. The other ants paused and looked at them in what was definitely concerned curiosity. I wished I could have understood the pheromones. You okay, Teddy? Feel like my guts are going to shit themselves out, sir. Was it the huge mass of ejaculate you happily gorged yourself on? I, I believe so. That first ain't looked at the others with a definite appeal for assistance, and then his thorax just melted. That does not look good, Teddy. Feels worse, sir. The rest of the ants went off like the fireworks or a pen of Jiffy Pop. Blobber just began exploding out of the shivering cottonous bodies, then absorbing the remains before oozing back together. The issue was the four of us were basically at ground zero of the ruptures. Whatever the shells were made of exploded in jagged shards and splinters of brick tore across my face. This was pleasant compared to the shower of ant guts and regurgitated bukkake. It was as pleasant as you'd imagine. And then it was over. I opened my eyes cautiously and saw Blobbert reconstitute himself. Well, if that is real, that just seems unfucking fair. I muttered and lit a smoke under the assumption it would be my last one. Hell of a shame to waste all that perfectly good weed. The Gornado was kind of rad, Brad said as he joined me. Glad you enjoyed yourself. They sort of suck when you aren't prepared. I got blowed up by a grenade after my first Gornado, I said with a smile. You look like you healed pretty good after, he said as he began to take in the breadth of what lay in front of us. Fuck. Fuck what? Chrissy asked. I got ain't in my mouth and down my ass crack, the gnome added. Blobbert sped in front of us, the advancing army of ants obscured by his nearly translucent form, all except a gigantic one flying above the swarm. Had we been anywhere except for the flat nothing that is Ohio, I could have hazarded a guess at the number. Instead, it could have been anything from 50 to 200. That has to be the queen, Chrissy said. That bitch is controlling the rest then, Brad said. I looked at him. You know a lot about ants? He nodded. Seen a couple documentaries. What's the second bubble called? He frowned. The... Thorax? I goddamn knew it was a word. I just nodded. I don't think he knew exactly what to say to that. Uh, no offense to Blobbert. I'd like to swim inside of him if I'm being honest. It's all I want to do, but I also know I shouldn't. Why is that? Chrissy asked. He does that, I said, hoping to sound sage, but likely came off as clueless as I was. I'm gonna go touch it. The gnome said. I'd recommend strongly against that. Blobbert is not particular of whom he consumes, I said in apathetic warning. Whom he consumes? Whom? Consume? Almost as meaningless sounding as ain't and Xenia. <coughs> Chrissy let out a sharp cry as Jason walked into Blobbert. He just stood there for a moment before slowly turning to face us. I wish he hadn't. Half of his beard and the face beneath had just vanished, and the skull that smiled at us above his open abdominal cavity. For a gnome, he was packing a decent hog. A shame, seeing as it dissipated in front of us in a flash. All of them did. We should have asked him where he kept his gold, I muttered. I think that's a leprechaun, Brad said. We can't be sure he wasn't a leprechaun. He denied being a garden gnome. I countered. He's just fucking gone, Chrissy said with a gasp. I did warn him, I stated. Something tickled my brain, and I couldn't figure out what it was. 
I was almost there before the gnome decided to walk into oblivion. I clapped my hands. Pheromones! Brad and Chrissy just stared at me while the buzzing of large wings got louder. The ants communicate with pheromones, the same way Blobbert draws in food, I clarified. Chrissy nodded excitedly. Okay, uh, that makes sense. How do we use this to our advantage? I just stared at her for a long minute. How in the fuck would I know? It was just an observation more than anything. What if Blobbert led the ants off and we take care of the queen? Brad asked. I nodded and smiled at him. Okay, how? How what? He asked, confused. I gestured vaguely. All of it. He didn't answer. Blobbert, you think you can draw the ants away from the city? I asked. The lavender light swarmed towards me. Yeah, that bitch is going to be an issue, but we can't let the town get destroyed. Remember Puerto Rico? That was out of hand. We owe it to Xenia to be better, I reminded him. Blobbert drooped a little and then slithered forward to meet the swarm. Tendrils of blue cum lashed out and launched cars into the heart of the horde, where they exploded and launched an exoskeleton shrapnel into the air. The queen couldn't speak, but her rage was palpable, as Blobbert was a one-blob wrecking crew of ain't-destroying spunk. The first part of the plan that hadn't been planned out was working exactly as I assumed it would have, had any thought been put into it. I lit another cigarette and contemplated that flying fuckface as she launched loogies at Blobbert. I looked at Chrissy. You got a harpoon gun? She patted her t-shirt and blooding dirt-crusted bare legs. No. Why the fuck would I have a harpoon gun? First off, I am well fucking aware you don't have a goddamn harpoon gun on you. Secondly, how in the fuck would I know if you have a harpoon gun or not? That's why I asked, I said, and angrily took a drag. Why didn't you ask Brad? She rebutted. You think a giant pink bunny is going to have a harpoon gun? In what world do giant bunnies carry any weapons? That's just fucking absurd. I said, bewildered. I don't have one. I'm sorry. Brad said, a tone of dejection in his voice. I patted him on the shoulder. It's okay, big guy. You brought a tank. That was pretty cool. Oh, that can't be good. Chrissy said as she pointed at a river of the radioactive goo rushing our direction. Somewhere in between the ridiculous, out-of-context, incredulous reaction, Blobbert was bombarded by loogies and had split into four smaller birds. But the mass of toxic snot followed the road and there were three dumb fucks staring at it with open jaws. We started to run back around the wreckage of the dispensary, which was swollen and seemed to throb ominously, but no one said anything so I chalked it up to the 100% of the remaining 68% of the time when I was pretty fucking sure whatever I was seeing was not really something to be seen. Blind panic added a certain nuance to the affair as well. Whatever the fuck was or was not in the wreckage didn't stand a chance as the tidal wave of bright green crashed into the remaining structure and it all collapsed beneath the street level. The three of us stood out of breath and stared at the smoking crater. All that precious weed, Brad said solemnly. And Danny? Chrissy added. Yeah, her too. Brad amended his statement. He tried, about as hard as I tried to stop the gnome, I reckon. Which when you added up the clusterfuck of horrors that seemed to be the universe's answer to the birth of this somewhat tarnished nation, about all that could be expected if any of it were actually fucking happening. Blobbert was having a great time. I couldn't explain how I knew, but I did. I could feel his unbridled joy as he sent a blast of azure sploosh through an ain't, even as he blasted apart three others that had gorged upon him. Blobbert was gleefully decimating the ain't army, but despite his growth as he consumed the corpses, the swarm kept him too small to swat the queen bitch from the sky. I had a thought. If he could draw them in, could he turn them on one another? I felt Blobbert contemplate my thought, and I realized just how deeply our bond had grown. We would have serious fucking words about his brain fuckery, though, well intended or not. 
I went down the alley and saw huge plumes of smoke and roaring fires and blobbered on the steepled roof of a church doing his damnedest to swap the queen ain't from the sky. Blobbert must have figured out how to infuriate the ants and turned them on one another. The ferocious motherfuckers had no issue using those giant mandibles to snap limbs off their former best friends. If she doesn't get destroyed, she could form a new colony. Chrissy said as she joined me to watch the wanton violence unfold over what had once probably been a rather scenic view. Except it was Ohio. For all I knew, the ants had beautified the goddamn place. The queen ain't seemed to tire of Blobbert's bullshit. She launched a loogie against the side of the steepled bell tower and sent the entire building crashing. Unfortunately, the church was the tallest building around without having to lure the remaining swarm and Big Mama Fuckface close enough for Blobbert to be effective into what was likely a more populated area. This shit was a lot easier before the ramifications were real. Really real. I took off my backpack and grabbed a couple of buds out of the baggie, found my trusty papers, and rolled two fat joints. We need a miracle, I muttered as I lit the first and inhaled deeply before passing it to Chrissy. You have a blob on speed dial. Any chance of knowing God's number? She asked as she passed it to Brad. Afraid not. Talked to her a few times, but I'm not all that certain what's happened and what didn't most of the time. Could have been a fucking tree. Never trust a sycamore, I said as I took the joint back. Anything non-coniferous is likely a fucking cunt. How does any of that help us now? Chrissy asked, a mite impatiently. I shrugged. I just let the universe provide. How has that worked out so far? Brad asked. I've been exploded, regrown, had my memories partially erased, and been put on what is basically a permanent acid trip by a glob of sentient ejaculate, I replied. But hearing it out loud didn't do a lot to reassure anyone, myself included. We need a fucking miracle, Chrissy said. I lit the second joint. A strange sound rumbled beneath the nearly silent battle. It reverberated my body in a sonic massage. Did you feel that? Brad asked with a frown. It happened again. Why does that seem familiar? I asked. Because you're fucking fried with enough THC to sedate a moose and an assortment of other things. Chrissy answered and rolled her eyes. She wasn't wrong, but it did feel familiar. Behind us, the shifting of wreckage grew louder. It's more of those ain'ts. They must have burrowed beneath the city. Brad said, one of his ears, the unscorched one, had fallen over his face. I nodded at him. More likely than a miracle for damn sure. Good weed, though. Damn. Why the fuck did you call it Cheetahcock? Chrissy frowned. We got a strain from Illinois called Cuckoo and cross-pollinated it with our own Indica we called Cheetah. Because it fucked you up quick, Brad added with a smile. Cheetah Cuckoo, Cheetahcock. Makes more sense than it has any right to, really, I said. It was mostly funny to make people ask for cock, Chrissy said and blushed. That made more sense than anything. The ground rumbled once more, louder and more intense, followed by the sound of what might have been a building collapsing. It was a sound I had heard before. That sounds like Elmer, I finally said as the last reverberations died off. The toad. Chrissy said flatly. It did, sort of. We got another swarm, Brad yelled. I couldn't tell you how many of the bastards were racing toward us suddenly, but I knew for a fucking fact it was too goddamn many of them. We were absolutely positively fucked. I was grateful for the foresight to have rolled two joints. It seemed to mellow the impending doom into just another nightmare. Chrissy grabbed my left hand and Brad grabbed my right as we stood and waited for death to rain down, but the ants paid no attention to us whatsoever and barreled past as if hell was directly on their trail. What the fuck? I began but was cut off by something long, pink, and glistening that shot down the street, then snapped back with an ant firmly in its grasp. I turned the direction the ant had been jerked down and my eyes widened. Remember Elmer? Little guy, shit at directions. 
he was now squatting with an ain't in his bulbous mouth. I had been telling women that three inches was actually six for so fucking long, I don't know if I had a true grasp on spatial measurements. But if the ain't was ten foot, and he was in Elmer's mouth, albeit struggling mildly against the expanding throat sack, well, fuck me, Elmer was at least... Is that a thirty-foot fucking Elmer? Chrissy asked. You see it too? I asked in reply. She just nodded as the ain't stopped struggling and sort of vanished into Elmer's tummy. Holy shit! Elmer, you got fucking huge! I shouted. Elmer looked at me and blinked slowly before letting out a low croak. It got all sorts of fuckered up after you got loogied on. Danny died. So did what may or may not have been a leprechaun, I said. Elmer expanded his throat a couple times. I didn't consider the gold aspect on the count of the giant fucking queen ain't. Blobber came back. Motherfucker erased my brain partially. Dosed me again as well. I said and pointed at the rubble that was the church and now had become the spot where the ain'ts congregated waiting for the queen to give orders. Elmer looked at the ain'ts and croaked loud enough to shatter what windows remained on both sides of the street. We came to the same conclusion. The bitch bites it and then it's just clean up. Elmer just sat there. I assumed he was doing some amphibian meditation. Is he asleep? Brad asked. I think he's finding his inner zen before battle, I said as I reached for my smokes. He is a toad, Chrissy reminded us. That checks out as well. Wait, was he fucking asleep? Elmer, I shouted. He opened one eye and glared at me. You can add shitty fucking miracle to your list of traits, along with poor conversationalist, I yelled. Dude. You should be nice to the giant toad, Brad said. Elmer croaked loud enough to knock us onto the ground. For fuck's sake, I mourned your wart covered ass, I yelled. Then I saw my cigarette had broken in the fall. You owe me a pack of fucking cigarettes, too! Elmer looked sufficiently chagrined. Could you just help, Blobber? I yelled nicely. Elmer glared at me once more, and I could see what he wanted. You were fucking right. Is that what you want to hear? Blobber and I are heroes? Well, we done fucked up as many places as we helped. And I had been brain erased, please. I asked, resigned. He is a toad. Chrissy reiterated. Elmer croaked loudly again and then leapt into the air and soared a block and a half toward the battle before landing with a ground-shaking slam. He is a fucking miracle, Brad said. I shook out a fresh smoke and realized I was really going to need a new pack soon at this rate. Then Chrissy glared at me, and I gave her one as well. Brad tried not to look at me, but I could feel his need and just fucking passed one to him too. Bunch of fucking moochies, I muttered as I passed my lighter. You realize you have a thousand dollars worth of weed in your backpack, right? Chrissy said. I frowned. That little bag? That's 50 bucks at the most. In 1983, maybe, <laughs> Brad said with a cough. I decided to ignore that. I folded it up very small and then stuffed it into the farthest corner of my mind, next to the memories of Cherry's Cherry. Chrissy stared at me as I helped her up. How did you make friends with both a toad and a giant blob of space jizz? I smiled at her. I'm nearly positive none of it's real. If you face and accept the absurdity of the universe rather than fight it, you'll find it goes a hell of a lot smoother. Brad smiled as I helped him up. You're pretty smart, Gear. My name is Ursa, my bunny rabbit friend. I said back, confused but uncertain if we had actually been introduced. That was about a month ago. When he really likes someone, he calls them Gear sometimes. Chrissy whispered. A toad and a pink bunny. The menagerie was getting stranger every time I turned around. Holy fuck, would you look at them go? I hollered and pointed at Blobbert and Elmer. Elmer had his tongue wrapped around the queen ain't and was trying his best to yank her royal cuntiness to the ground, while Blobbert was protecting his flank by flinging chunks of concrete into the path of loogies. 
and demolishing ants that got too close. It didn't take long to realize the boys were horribly outnumbered. Then I had an idea. Money shot the flying cunt. I thought as hard as I could to blob her, trying to convey my intent in images. Um, Ursa, you okay? Chrissy asked, concerned. Better than. Might have just come up with a plan. Depends on how well those two can communicate, I said with a grin. Your uh, nose is bleeding, Ursa, she said. Getting used to the newfangled communication. Might have overthought that one, I said as I realized the wave of dizziness might not be from the chemicals I had ingested. Elmer let go of the queen and she flew high into the air as she overcompensated for the sudden lack of force. He turned and opened his mouth as wide as possible and Blobbert sprayed into his mouth. It was far more off-putting than it sounded, considering the mouth was that of a toad and the load was blue and had floating ant parts in it. Elmer crouched low and the ants paused as he launched himself high into the air and when he was even with the queen, spat Blobbert all over her. Money shot! I yelled. Snowball! Snowball! Chrissy and Brad yelled. I looked at them in confusion. What the fuck is a snowball? That was a money shot. A money shot is when a guy nuts on her face. Chrissy explained. A snowball's when you spit it back into his mouth. Or the queen ain't in the face. Same difference. Brad finished. Wait. You're saying the guy comes in the lady's mouth, and then she will spit that back into his mouth? I asked, trying to do the math in my head. The queen slammed into the ground and twitched as Blobbert oozed all over her. The ants all stopped and stared as the queen slowly dissolved. Elmer let out a victorious croak that set off some sort of alarms far in the distance. I was about to shout in victory when I felt arms wrap around me and the softest lips suddenly kissing mine. I stared in shock as Brad's mustache tickled my nose and pushed him off as delicately as possible. Chrissy just fucking laughed. It was sort of anticlimactic after that. Ain't I climactic? They can't all be winners, I reckoned. The ain'ts just sort of dispersed. A sad group of maybe twenty or so survivors. I got the vibe from Blobbert he had convinced them to go live out the rest of their days in peace, probably. Elmer came bounding back and knocked me to the fucking ground again when he landed in front of us. I appreciate the fuck out of you, Elmer. You're shit at directions, but that can be learned if you apply yourself. Thanks for helping Blobbert and I out. I said as I stood and patted him on whatever the fuck part of the toad I touched. I hoped I wouldn't get a wart. Elmer flared his throat and looked at Brad. Brad, Elmer wants to know if you want to go on an adventure with him, I said to the smiling pink bunny. I think I'd like that very much, Gear, he said with a dreamy smile. Wait, you get your memories back. Brad gets a fucking toad partner. What do I get? Chrissy demanded. I pulled the bag of weed out and held it out for her. Sell you this for 50 bucks, you can start the business over. Elmer croaked lowly. Or you can go with Mr. Bunny and Mr. Toad, I suggested. She smiled at that. Maybe get some fucking pants and shoes first, I added seriously. What about you and Blobbert? She asked, a look of concern in her eyes. I shrugged. Neither of us care for the cold much, and I'm pretty sure we're wanted dead on sight through most of South America. I'd like to go back to Texas at some point. If you stick around, they'll treat you like a hero, Brad suggested. I sighed. If any of us stick around, they won't treat us like heroes. They'll do terrible things to Blobbert and Elmer and put us in cages for the rest of our lives. We heard sirens approaching. The sounds of the battle and sudden silence must have woken the police. That's our cue, I said to them. I gave Elmer's front leg a hug, then Chrissy and Brad as well. Blobbert, we need to get smokes and some beer-flavored fucking beer. Wait until I tell you about the horseshit these savages brought to celebrate the founding of our great nation, I said as I slid inside the jiggling mass of cerulean spunk. I didn't look back at Chrissy and Brad as they climbed onto Elmer. I wasn't even fucking sure they were there. 
but I had the strangest feeling I would see them again. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.